Hi, I'm Tim Lenton. I'm a professor of climate change at the University of Exeter in the UK and I want to talk to you about positive tipping points that can help us avoid bad climate tipping points. So we live in an incredible world and we live within a kind of living complex system, our life support system, but also in complex societies. And all complex systems have under particular conditions the ability to pass tipping points from one state to another and just to give you a feel for that I'm going to show a little movie of a system that I'm pushing towards a tipping point. So this is a system with two alternative states it can be in. Uh, it can only be in one of them at any time but that one that it's in I'm making less stable and there are some telltale signs as the system in the state it's in loses stability um, as the feedbacks that maintain the status quo get weaker we see the way the system behaves slow down and then at some point we see the system tip from one state to another which means that some really strong amplifying feedbacks are propelling change in that system in a way that if I took the forcing away the tipping point would just continue and what's important about the tipping point is it's an abrupt change and it's really hard to reverse. Now, I've spent a lot of the last 20 years mapping out the bad tipping points in the climate system that we don't want to cross if we can avoid them. I won't talk about all of these, but they're involving the loss of major ice sheets, um, large amounts of sea level rise resulting from that, reorganizations of the circulation of the ocean or the atmosphere that would change weather patterns across the world, and the loss of major parts of the biosphere. Unfortunately these bad climate tipping points are coupled together in a way where often tipping one of them makes tipping another more likely. So we can think about a tipping point cascade and in this case a bad one. Now these are one of the many reasons why uh, we need to act decisively to limit global warming and we're not doing that decisively enough. We're not decarbonizing the global economy as it's called nearly fast enough to, to get towards what's called a net zero greenhouse gas emissions. We're going about five times too slowly and we need to go a lot quicker. And that's why I want to talk about positive tipping points as our best hope of accelerating the change we need. But to introduce that I'm just going to go back into history and to a distant relative of mine. Um, this is Lydia Lenton who uh, if you see the photograph is wearing a number on her jacket that indicates she's in prison and the photograph is taken in the year 1913 giving a hint that Linian was one of the original suffragettes in the UK fighting for the vote for women and she was in prison because um, she had burned down the tea house in Kew Gardens in London and like many suffragettes in prison she was on hunger strike but while she was on hunger strike she was force fed and unfortunately they put the tube down the wrong way into her lungs and nearly drowned her. When she was rushed to hospital the government instigated a cover up and said that she wasn't, um, she was only in hospital because of the hunger strike she'd been on. Then it was quickly realised that that was a lie and that's one of many little events in the fight for votes for women that turned public opinion against the then government and in favour of the movement that ultimately caused a profound social tipping point because it doubled the democratic voting population of our country and of course that movement spread around the world. Now much more recently we've seen a different kind of social tipping dynamics in the climate movement starting with the brave actions of Greta Thunberg who by deciding to skip school uh, and protest outside the Swedish parliament made it a little bit easier for the next person to make the brave move of defying their parents and the government and the school uh, and join her on strike for more decisive climate action. And as they join, they make it incrementally easier for the next person to join and so on. And this creates a kind of exponential growth, the self-reinforcing feedback growth of the population of protesters. And that population doubled 
every week roughly for about six months and within that time it grew to millions of protesters um, by then not just school children but people of all ages um, calling for more decisive climate action around the world which has been an amazing tipping point but only really counts as Greta would remind us if we actually act in a way that changes the behaviours or the technologies um, that are responsible for greenhouse gas emissions and reduces them. So that's what I want to talk about next and I want to go back to history because I've got to try and convince you that we can change technology really quickly or behaviour really quickly because we have done in the past. And to illustrate that, let's look at a photograph of the Easter Parade in Fifth Avenue, New York City in the year 1900. And the challenge is to spot the one person in an automobile when everybody else is in a horse-drawn carriage. They're actually over on the right-hand side of the street as they come coming towards us. But if we go to a photograph of the Easter Parade on the same street, Fifth Avenue, New York City, but 13 years later, in 1913, at the time when uh, Lillian was in hospital in London, uh, we have the opposite challenge in the photograph to spot the, l the last person left in a horse-drawn carriage when everybody else is in an automobile. Actually, they're on almost the same position on the street on the right-hand side coming towards us. But the point is, this was a fundamental change in how people moved around and in our cities and ultimately in our whole landscape of the transition to the car and it unfolded within a decade across US cities and continued to spread around the world. Now part way through that transition there was a time even a century ago where about 30% of the vehicles were battery electric but uh, the Model T Ford, the combustion engine, won out. And ever since, the electric vehicle has been trying to kind of make its way in as the alternative form of personal mobility. And finally, it's getting there, and it's got there first um, in the little old country of Norway, thanks to some social activists who really begun the extraordinary change. So I'll show you a photograph of pop members of the pop band AHA, together with uh, an architecture professor, Harold Rosvik, and an environmentalist, Frederick Hauger, who together um, imported uh, what in the photograph is a hobby-converted uh, electric vehicle, what in the UK we'd have called a Fiat Panda. They, they imported this vehicle to Norway, but with a bunch of demands on the then Norwegian government to incentivize the switch to clean electric transport and they knew because uh, several of them were world famous pop stars that the media would follow them everywhere they went and shine a light on their story and they demanded that the import registration tax for this electric vehicle and every electric vehicle thereafter be waived which saved about 20 percent on the price of the vehicle they also demanded that road tolls uh, be waived for all electric vehicles. That was a long fight to win, took about seven or eight years, and they had a bunch of other clever demands that initially the government resisted, but over time began to get on board with. And that getting on board and creating what I call enabling conditions for a tipping point is crucial to why uh, in the last decade basically battery electric vehicles have completely taken over the market in Norway gone from a few percent of the market to now well over 80 percent of the market. And the rest of the world is following in a kind of positive tipping point cascade as the electric vehicle takes over the market country by country. That's interesting in and of itself. It's vital for reducing greenhouse gas emissions because cars are responsible for over 10 percent of those. Um, but it also opens up another opportunity space because the more electric vehicles get made and the more batteries get made, the cheaper the next battery gets to make. Well, that's great for bringing the price down of electric vehicles, and that could be cars, but it also, cheap batteries enables electrifying other forms of transport, like goods transport. Um, this rapid growth of electric vehicles might be the thing that convinces oil firms that they're sat on stranded effort assets and they have to redefine themselves as something else. But also, cheap batteries are a crucial enabler for the big revolution to renewable energy.
because uh, when we want to boil the kettle isn't always when the sun's shining or the wind's blowing. So we're going to need cheap forms of storage, including batteries in the future, electricity grid. Which brings me to my second good news story of recent positive tipping point. And that's in my country, the UK, um, where essentially in the last 10 years we've gone from 40% of our electricity from burning coal in power stations uh, to pretty much zero coal burning for electricity. And all the difference has been made up for by a massive growth in renewable energy power supply. A lot of it uh, in the UK wind power and especially offshore wind power that's growing rapidly. Now that particular tipping point was triggered by a really modest uh, price on carbon emissions in the power sector that the government introduced. But it's part of a bigger picture where it should give us the confidence that while we can change quickly our power supply and when we look in the global context we find that um, the more wind turbines we make or the more solar panels we make the cheaper the next one gets to make a vital reinforcing feedback that's responsible for the fact that renewable energy and renewable power is now the cheapest form of electricity generation in most of the world and it's continuing to get cheaper so we're going to a, an extraordinary future where electricity will be cheaper than it's ever been and that's a big incentive to use it to electrify lots of other things like transport but also heating our homes and using leftover if you like renewable electricity to make uh, other fuels where they're needed like hydrogen. If we put this all together we're seeing the potential for positive tipping points to cascade through the economy I mentioned how those cheap batteries from the electric vehicle revolution helped the transition to renewable energy, but at the same time, the more renewable energy there is, the cheaper it gets, the more that incentivizes the switch to electric vehicles. So we've got lovely reinforcing feedback within the economy. And that's what we need to work together to find and trigger those positive tipping points. So faced with an enormous and daunting problem like climate change and the scary possibility of climate tipping points, we're bound to be asking what can I do and the point I want to leave you with is we all have some agency to be part of positive tipping point change. Just as consumers we can choose to um, purchase or adopt a different technology, we can change our behaviour clearly in ways that reduce emissions but that encourage other people to do so. But if we take a bigger view of us, we're probably not just uh, humble consumers, we have some agency. If we're in the media, we can help tell the story of positive change, which can help reinforce change. If we're in the finance sector, we can shift capital, and that's a powerful lever of amplifying change. And of course, we want our governments, uh, our governors, as well as us, the citizens, to be on side with progressive policies like we saw in their adoption in Norway in the electric vehicle case. Basically when all these factors come together, the top down and the bottom up, then I think we have a great chance to uh, find and trigger the positive tipping points we're going to need to avoid the climate and ecological crisis. Thanks very much.